Happy Wednesday. Everyone. My name is Lindsay Brown, and on behalf of Beyond Clean and our sponsor for today's event, Census Technologies, I want to thank you for joining us for what I know will be an engaging and insightful conversation. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is one that I'm really excited about, and I know that it's not necessarily a new conversation for anyone. We all work in healthcare, and as healthcare professionals and huma humans on planet Earth, quite frankly, we've all become very familiar with the impact of COVID-19. When we talk to our colleagues, when we talk to our family and friends, um, a lot of times when we have conversations about the pandemic, we probably hear themes surrounding fear, uh, themes surrounding exhaustion, maybe some glimpses of hope here and there. Certainly the idea of resiliency has to come up um, often, hopefully. Uh, and as healthcare workers, you've been tasked with caring and reassuring when everyone else is, feared with, is filled with that fear and anxiety. You've been tasked with showing up when everyone else is shutting in. You've been tasked with coming in contact with some of the most dangerous situations involving sickness and disease. And that's not new necessarily, but you keep showing up. And so I want to thank you for that. And in preparation for this discussion, I'd like to ask where you're all tuning in from. So in the comments section, if you don't mind just telling us where you're tuning in from. I'm here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I would love to hear where you're showing up from. So if you have an opportunity, definitely share your location with us in the comments. And again, welcome. This isn't the first global health issue that the human race has had to fight through. And what that means, unfortunately, is it probably won't be the last. Knowing that provides us all with the opportunity to learn some valuable lessons and implement those lessons learned about how our teams work together, about how our teams communicate. And today, in the middle of Women's History Month and on the heels of International Women's Day, it is my sincere honor to welcome four dynamic and inspiring women to discuss four different perspectives on the impact that COVID-19 has had on their departments and on their function in the healthcare space. Our panelists are Marie Brewer, Sterile Processing Manager at Unity Point Health in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Jill Holdsworth, Infection Prevention Man Manager at Emory University Hospital. Uh, Melanie Perry, host of the First Case OR podcast, an OR circulator for University Hospital in Alabama. And finally, Kelly Swales, the Senior Clinical Educator for Census Technologies. So I'm so excited to invite them all to this panel discussion. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Now, as we get this discussion started, we have some folks who are tuning in from St. Louis, from United Arab Emirates, from Missouri, from Madison, Wisconsin. We've got Chicago, Hanover, Illinois, um, Indonesia. Welcome, everyone. We are so excited that you're tuned in to this discussion. I want to start on, uh, you know, there's really no light note to start on really with the discussion about the pandemic. So I'm excited to get right into this discussion. Um, the first question that I have, and Jill, if you don't mind, we'll just start with you on this and kind of go around Jill, Melanie, um, Kelly, and Marie. We'll go around and talk about if you put yourself back 12 months, put yourself back to March 2020, okay? Pandemic is just starting. Things are just starting to shut down. What did you initially think the impact of COVID-19 would have on your team? Sure, thanks. Um, hey, everybody. So when, whenever we have anything like this that's going on, we do a lot of planning. So when we're talking about any kind of infectious disease or any kind of emergency that's happening, we all think that, oh, it's, it, you know, it might not be that big of a deal. We're going to have to do some training. We're going to have to do some education. I don't think anybody was quite prepared for what was going to happen or exactly how much impact it was going to have. So, you know, we we hit the anniversary this week of our first admitted COVID patient. We're all just kind of sitting back and reflecting on what were we feeling a year ago and what were the feelings of, of all of those staff, at the first person that we admitted and were we were we fearful? What, what were we feeling back then and, and how have we changed? And it's just it's amazing to think how how far we've come in, in a year and to go back and think of what were we thinking it would how it would impact us is just an incredible thing to think about. We definitely weren't thinking that 
we would be spending so many nights awake receiving calls and receiving pages. And um, it's, it's actually pretty emotional for our team to think back to that time and to think of, of how much we've gone through, how many people we've, we've helped get through this time, how much planning and replanning and replanning we've gone through. But we planned for this one just like we would any other infectious disease emergency or an emergency management plan. And we did after action reports on each and every person that came in that was a person under investigation. And at that time, we thought we would be able to do that on every single person, every PUI. And, and now we think about that of all of the, the hundreds of people that we've had come in that was a PUI thinking we would do an after action report on every one of those people. And, and it's, there's no way that we would be able to do that. But the amount of planning we thought that we did, it wasn't nearly enough. So it, the impact that it's had on us, it, we, were we would have never been prepared. And I don't know how we, we would have been. So I think everybody's kind of in that boat that there's no way we would have known what was getting ready to happen but we were trying trying to be prepared but it's it's a lot more than we ever could have imagined i agree jill it was it was overwhelming when it started and it was um we were very unsure there was a lot of anxiety a lot of just what's going to happen i work in the operating room and we didn't really know how was all of this going to affect our ability to operate on patients? How are we going to safely operate on patients? And how are we going to be able to do it with supplies? Because the operating room depends on sterile supplies for everything. And you're watching the supply chain be affected by um, backordered, by unavailability, everything. And we just, I, I really felt like going back all the way back to last March, I really felt like, I don't, I don't know if we're going to have what we need so that we can do our job. And I don't know if we're going to have what we could, what we need, so our patients can be safe, so that we can be safe. Um, it was just really a lot of uncertainty and a lot of anxiety. And then you go through the year, and we did have back orders, we did have problems, we did have supply shortages, but we managed, and we were able to do it. We were able to keep going, and we learned a lot of lessons in the process. But that was really what I took away from the very beginning was just that that uncertainty of how were we going to be able to do what do the job that we always have done with the uncertainty of COVID. And yeah, and I can add to that, you know, when we first, um, our company had, you know, kind of, as I say, grown at everyone because we weren't traveling. And at first, I was, my first thought was, well, that's what I do for a living. I go into hospitals and I do, you know, assessments with our SensorTrack product to see how our customers utilizing it. And then I schedule training from there. Well, if I can't travel, how do I do my job? And so right first, that was our biggest, you know, what are we all going to do? Um, I, you know, we were um, grounded for March and April, and my first thought was, why would we do two months? You know, this is ridiculous. It'll be done by the end of the month, and then we can be back to travel. Um, so little did I realize a year later, here we're still dealing with this. Um, but I think, you know, for us, one of the biggest for us in the impact was when we could go back to traveling was, you know, is it safe? Um, you know, can I be traveling? Now, in the last, or last year, I flew over 50 flights. Um, stayed safe, you know, 100, 100 nights in a hotel room um, and stayed safe through it all. So I was very fortunate and lucky. But yeah, I mean, it was, we were all, you know, what can we do during this time? You know, what can we, what kind of projects can we work on? And, you know, fortunately, we all had things to do. Um, we kind of came together and, you know, it was, it, it was a real shocker though when, you know, I'm getting notifications from all our credentialing companies saying that no access, no access, you know, vendors can't come on site. And I'm just kind of watching, you know, this is my job. What am I going to do? But, you know, it, it all worked out so far. And I think in the sterile processing setting, we didn't anticipate there would be any change to the scope of practice for our normal cleaning and sterilization procedures. We were ready. We fight viruses every day. Um, so our focus was mostly on the need to be flexible and open to change. Uh, we knew we were going to need to assist with the education on the floors for disinfection protocols and patient equipment and such. Um, and so really our training with our team was um, relentless communication on the why, the what, when, and how of the disinfection protocols. Um, our biggest concern at the time was, was there going to be increased pressure to turn over respiratory equipment or code carts um, to meet the patient demands? So I think really our focus at the time was just reinforcing our dedication to patient safety and adhering to procedures, but we weren't 
prepared for the supply shortage, shortages of even chemicals and disinfectants and such like that. So um, kind of having to come up with plan B was, was surprising. Lindsay, you're muted. Yep. Sorry, I noticed that something that I love, and that's been the, the motto for, for the last year, I think, is you're on mute. But <laughs> uh, I love the, the fact that the four of you are on this discussion because we have the vendor perspective represented. We have the infection prevention perspective represented, the operating room perspective and the sterile processing perspective. And even though we're all in different departments, we all are working with our teams toward the, sa the same goal. But keeping that in mind, we all have very different teams and very different team dynamics to work through. And especially when it's you know a global pandemic that we're all dealing with in our own ways in our departments, something that I'm really curious about is what impacts of the pandemic were you or were your team not prepared for? Because I think that that's where the lessons learned comes in. Um, so if you could just um, all share with you, what, what were some things that caught you off guard or caught you by surprise? And Marie, if we don't mind, if you don't mind kicking off this sure. conversation, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I think the hardest thing for us were the staff that avoided coming to work out of fear or who left the healthcare field entirely. That was heartbreaking. Um, the obvious um, things about leading outside the boundaries of the normal IFU process with mask reprocessing or, or decontamination protocols. I'm very thankful um, of how involved Amy and AORN and Isham were involved in helping lead that. Um, looking at just simple human performance metrics. When you add stress into the mix, that error rate can rise. And, you know, mitigating that required a very deliberate investment into the technicians themselves. And oftentimes this was in the form of emotional or or even economic support going to the foundation to help some some folks who whose partners had lost their job. Um, you know, I think leading those discussions with empathy was always my goal. And um, connecting with the individual itself. With the transition, I think the biggest surprise we had, and we're still experiencing it, with the transition, with businesses allowing people to work from home, there are a lot of vacant buildings for us downtown in Cedar Rapids, and we've experienced water quality challenges due to the change in water usage. Um, our building uses about 80,000 gallons a day, and um, we have advanced um, water quality uh, system online here with remote monitoring, multiple safeguards, um, and but we can't control what flows into the building. And so when pH issues arise, um, those are challenging to mitigate. So I think one of the other things we hadn't counted on was just the emotional toll with some of us not being able to see our family. We have folks whose loved ones are in nursing facilities and care facilities that haven't been able to see their parents in over a year. Um, and as, as ladies had mentioned, just a lot of supply shortages. And um, I think that, that we, we are still ex experiencing those challenges. All right. Yeah. Jill, do you okay. mind adding sure. on to that? Sure. Um, in infection prevention, we, we've had a, a, obviously a, a little bit different of a, a perspective, but some different challenges. I think one of the things that we weren't as prepared for is how people would kind of lean on the IP perspective for so many different things. And if your facility didn't know who the IPs were before COVID, I think every facility probably knows what an IP or infection prevention is now, which is, is great. And, um, and it also has um, a lot of uh, pressure and responsibility that goes along with that also. And what we weren't prepared for is is how much people were gonna lean on us just to help with confidence and help with things that, um, just in reassuring them. And what we learned was a lot of team members didn't wanna just read an email about what was going on with COVID. They didn't wanna just read about vaccines from an email. They wanted to hear it from an actual human body that was talking to them in person. And they wanted to be able to ask their personal questions to someone who they, felt was an expert and that they trusted and they wanted to know that there was someone there that they could ask all the time that they could go to in person or they could actually call on the phone and that they felt like that was their go-to person and and that became us in many instances in the past year all hours of the day 
um, it didn't matter if it was a weekend or a holiday or at 2 a.m. We have been fielding those calls and those questions and it has been um, really hard on on IPs in, in general. I've um, compared it many times to we feel like flight attendants a lot when you hit turbulence and people look at us as the flight attendants. And if we falter at all when things get get scary or when they get um, when they get rough, if you if your if your face shows fear at all, then everybody shows fear. So we've had to be really kind of tough this past year as the infection prevention department and and let everybody know that it's going to be okay and that we have the education and we have the tools that we need to make sure that everybody is is doing um, everything that we need to do and we're going to make sure that everybody is um, is is going to be okay through all of this and we're going to give you the education that you need and and that's been really hard on us too because there there hasn't been a time that we haven't been in the hospital and that we haven't been on site and then it, it's kind of like it doesn't give us that time to decompress and to break down sometimes too when when we really need that time also and i think that's been one of the most unexpected things for our team yet also one of the the hardest and it's made our team kind of become closer to as infection prevention i know that um throughout the organization with APIC and throughout all IPs, we've really struggled with this through resiliency and and how do you keep IPs from um, burnout and um, it's it's been really it's been really tough. It's we feel like we're we're here for everybody, but then we we kind of need that support system here for us too. And um, that's that's been one of the things we've struggled with the most because we don't know who that other person is that's supposed to support us when we're supporting everybody else. Melanie, you're on mute. Yeah, I got it. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I was saying that infection prevention was huge for us. The information that y'all gave us over the course of the year that employee health distributed was very helpful because I don't think that as a whole, in, in my operating room anyway, I just, the information was, was critical to helping with the anxiety that we felt. We didn't know if our patients at the beginning, before they put certain protocols in place for how our hospital was going to manage COVID versus not. We, we didn't know if our patient possibly had COVID. We didn't know who we were intubating. How were we exposing ourselves, our room, our, our fellow coworkers, who was being exposed to all of this? And so there was a lot of anxiety, but the communication and the information we were given was, was very helpful. The other thing that we experienced that I wasn't prepared for though, was actually after the shutdown, when we came back, we came back with a vengeance and we were busy and we worked through our backlog very quickly. And we have had more cases each month than we've had prior to COVID. And so you're working with more cases. You're busier than you have been, but you still have a tax supply system that you're still trying to get sterile supplies. All your gowns are kind of being monitored for how, how many sterile gowns, how many gloves, how much and sanitizers, all of these products that you still need to do your job in a time when you're actually busier than you kind of expect it to be. And it's been exhausting and um, challenging to meet the demand with the, the different manufacturing and disruptions that maybe that have come just because COVID is still present and still affecting things. But that's kind of where we found, I, that's where I saw that I wasn't really expecting or prepared for, for that. And to kind of piggyback on what you were saying about being busy, you know, when this first happened, um, our team, you know, we weren't prepared to not be able to go on site to hospitals. You know, that that's what we do. Um, we go on site and we provide training or assessments. And so we're always face to face with the customer. And so when all of a sudden, you know, we can't travel, um, you know, due to just the health concerns. And then along with we couldn't travel because hospitals did not want us on site. We had to get kind of creative. Um, and figure out, you know, ways that we could do our assessments. And then along with that, when we could go back to traveling, that fear. I mean, I envisioned walking into a hospital and it was just COVID everywhere and I'm going to get it. And, you know, then when he got there and kind of saw that reality that there, you guys are busy. I mean, everybody, there was times when I would, you know, say, can I come on site and do this assessment? And it was, no, we are too busy. You know, we, we didn't do any surgeries for a couple months and now we're just packed. You know, we're there one after another. And so then even trying to schedule training became challenging for us for some because they, they they couldn't take the time out to train 
and you know get up to speed on some things when they have such a backlog and you know hurry and turn over all these um, sets for their next patient and so it was i mean just kind of the you know how can we be creative what can we do and um you know so we started doing virtual assessments so that um you know i would just with customers have them um, log into their sense track and then share their screen and we would go through it together um you know i didn't do any virtual trainings um you know with on the clinical side we didn't do any virtual trainings I'm not saying that that's not still an option because i have customers in canada that you know i can't get over there and yes i'm in minnesota i'm like right you know, i'm right by the border um but they still you know i can't go into canada and do my assessments or do my training um so who knows how long that will be before we can um and so we may have to start going you know a virtual training route or see what kind of new um ideas that we can come up with. But from a vendor perspective, and even just talking to other vendors on site, um, you know, when I've been on at different hospitals, and just the concern with, you know, the the PPEs. And, you know, when I go on site, I always say, you know, do you have a bunny suit or let me put scrubs on? And I yet I feel really bad. You know, if I have to put on a bunny suit, I feel bad because like I'm taken away, you know, um, from somebody else, or having to put on shoe covers and hats and um, so, you know, I was kind of saved decontam for the last, you know, so that's the last thing we do. And then we can just take everything off and be done rather than, you know, many times I'm putting something on and then we go to decontam and I take that off and I put on new. So it's just kind of seen how we've all had to be creative and then really work together, um, you know, with that supply that we have a shortage of. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> I want to jump back to something that Jill mentioned. Um, Jill, you had mentioned the word burnout. And I feel like that's something that needs to be paid specific attention to, especially as we slowly climb out of this hole that we've been in, in the middle of the pandemic, you know, hopefully finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Burnout is a real thing, especially for healthcare providers. And I do have a poll question that I'd love to ask everyone who is tuning in. And this is going to be a little bit of a, uh, a rapid fire for the panelists, but I want to ask all the audience members, what is one thing that your department leaders have done to either curb or solve burnout? burnout in your department over the last year. And panelists, what I would love to hear from you is if there's anything specific that you've done for your staff. And also, your, your burnout and your level of burnout is important too. So Jill, you made a great point, like who's, who's filling our cup? We're filling other people's cup. We're providing information for other departments and other people and making sure that they have what they need, but who's doing that for us? And so I would love to just get your insight if there's any one person that you want to call out specifically as a thank you or anything that your hospital has done for you or for your department that's really helped kind of put that burnout level at bay? You know, one thing we talk about here is um, is gratitude and and what what really counts. What, what means something to me as gratitude versus what doesn't feel genuine? And I think that that is um, something that has really helped us through COVID and, and what I think can really help a lot of people. So to me saying, um, you know, th thank you for, for all of the work that you've done over the past year might not mean as much to me as someone coming to me and saying something very specific to me about something very specific that I did for them in their department. So I think that's something that, um, that can be used anywhere that if you have someone in the OR or if you have someone in still processing that did something very specific, that it's going to mean something a lot more to them if you go to them and say, I really appreciate what you did with this specific project instead of just saying, I, I really appreciate you coming to work through COVID. You know, it, it's, it means a lot more coming from somebody that you respect um, and talking about something very specific that you did. And I know that means a lot more to me than just saying um, kind of something very vague. Then if a leader comes to me and, and thanks me for a specific project, a specific work that I did within the OR or within the ED, um, because then I, I realize that they really do recognize the work that I specifically did and they actually know about the work that I did. And I hope that, I hope that makes sense because they're actually really recognizing 
the the project that you worked on rather than um, just saying it to say it. And I and I think that's what's really important. You don't want someone to feel like it's just being said to be said. You want it to be said and to really mean something. And um, as far as your your poll question, I think one of the biggest struggles this past year is what what do you do in the form of celebrations and gatherings in the time when we can't gather and we can't celebrate and we can't go anywhere. I know my team loves to go places and we love to go do things together. We love to go out to dinners. We love to do things like happy hour. We used to always go ice skating at Christmas time. We used to do, do all of these things together. And in the, the world of the past year where we can't do all of those things, what do you do? So we, we had to become really creative in the things that, um, you know, the things that we were doing. So um, I, I did, we, we did like walks to Starbucks and I don't know where everybody lives, but we're in a city. So we would do just kind of general walks down the street to get things. And, and one, at one point, all the Starbucks were closed except one in Atlanta that was only open in a drive through So we literally walked through the drive through and they let us, and I don't, I'm not even sure it's allowed, but um, they let us and they probably just felt sorry for us. But, you know, think you have to get really creative, especially in times where you really can't gather in a lot of places and places aren't open and um, asking your teams, what would they like to do? And I think that's what's really important is as a leader, what I might find fun is not what some of my colleagues might find fun. I mean, I have kids and I'm older than a lot of the people that might report to me and they may find things fun that I don't. So you have to kind of pull people what they might find fun and then kind of pull those ideas together and let them have a say in it too. And I think that's really important too, is that you ask everybody for their ideas. <clears throat> All right, thank you for that. Um, I wanna move on to the next question. And I think it's one that we've touched on in a couple of different ways, um, but it's more about collaboration. Um, and what I want to know from all of you is in what ways did, did this experience, um, this global pandemic, force your teams to both collaborate in better ways? And in what ways did it make collaboration more challenging for your specific teams? And Kelly, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. Yeah. So, you know, I look at this past year and I keep kind of my, my you know, my saying for the year is live and learn. Because everything that we have done this last year, it's live and learn. Um, you know, one one week we can do this, the next week we can't. And um, so through all this, I think, you know, um, our team, so I work on, on our clinical team, but even just our company as a whole, you know, really work together to say, how can we be creative? You know, what can we come up with so that, you know, we can still provide for our customers? We can still do these assessments. We can still, um, you know, look at training. And so with that, as I mentioned earlier, our virtual assessments. And, you know, at first when it was, you know, kind of we talked about it and I was thinking, well, how are we going to do that? Um, but we did it. And I've done these virtual assessments. They've been very successful. We've had wonderful feedback. And so that's where, you know, we, we came together and then live and learn, you know, so we maybe we did an assessment and kind of Ooh, let's add this to the next one. And um, it's just been a very successful, um, you know, thing that we took on and um, just kind of ran with it. And so that was a great time where, you know, we all came together and then how can we, we make this happen? And then um, I think one of the um, biggest challenges that we've had is um, is not having our FaceTime in our home office in Franklin, Tennessee. So, you know, I'm, I'm used to being in the office periodically, um, whether I'm teaching our CEM course, um, which is SenseTrack Essentials for Management. So whether I'm in there for that um, or in there in the office, you know, for our, our, our Christmas party, and so it's been very challenging um, not being able to have that FaceTime. But my company, um, kind of back to your, your last question there, what, what have we done for the burnout? So we are having um, weekly like get togethers via Teams meeting or Zoom, and we had a different theme. And so with that one week, it was wear your favorite concert t-shirt, um, you know, dress as your favorite character. Where I went out in the garage and dug in the Halloween bin and dug out my daughter's old um, Disney Sully costume. I was only able to get it over my head because it's probably like a size 4T. Um, but you know, we got really creative and had fun and just the laughing that we're all just you know kind of being crazy and goofy and bringing everyone together um, because we because we can't be together. 
So yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I just look at this as kind of the whole brainstorming that we've done through a lot of projects and um, it was, it was challenging, but I'm very pleased and happy with our outcomes from it. So Lindsay, I think um, as we were so physically siloed within our own departments, it made communication really challenging. And then just as, as mentioned, you know, trying to work through not being able to see each other face to face was tough. And then even when we were near one another, we were in masks and physically distant. So I think the biggest change that um, was positive for us was when our system upgraded to the Microsoft Teams. And this made such a big difference for us. Being able to see each other was wonderful. Um, we were we kind of figured out how to validate competencies at different affiliates and do walkthroughs. Um, so I think that that was fantastic. Um, you know, to meet some of those high surgical volumes like Melanie um, brought up, instead of, you know, travelers were just really not available. And um, so what we did was we incentivized the extra hours with an aggressive bonus plan, and we cross-trained staff across different divisions um, to fill those needs. And so we had a lot of people um, really engage in that program, and it was, it was a blessing um, because we were able to meet our needs um, in multiple departments, multiple divisions with direct patient care, and then also in the supportive roles as well. I think that that program itself really lent itself to build positive relationships across not only teams and departments, but affiliates, because we borrowed staff, sent them to different affiliates that were struggling. Um, we learned how to approach um, staffing strategically as a health system. For us to succeed, it required um, cooperation of cross-functional entities. And I think from a, from a personal perspective, um, as leaders, it taught us to become role models for things like recept um, being receptive, flexibility, uh, focus when dealing with uncertainty, and in the transitions, the, the constant transitions that COVID brought. Um, for us in the operating room, we, um, and when everything was so restrictive and the, at first after the shutdown, leadership from all the different ORs on our camp, our entire campus, we have multiple OR facilities, and they had to work together to make sure that we were still doing the surgeries that had to be done and that that we were properly delaying and queuing up the ones that we were putting on hold. So our non-emergent, non-urgent cases had to be put into a queue of some way that we could get back to them, that we were not harming our patients by putting their surgeries off. And because we have multiple OR facilities, all of the leadership really had to come together to say, yes, we're going to do this here, we're going to use this here, and figure out which way was going to be best to manage our caseload and then figure out the process for working through the backlog once we opened up again and how we were going to do it. Different department chairs were approving cases saying this could be done here, this would be done there. And they also, because of that, our surgical block time was lifted. So instead of surgeons having certain amounts of time where they could operate, they just said, it's first come first serve. You have cases to do, let's do cases. And because of that, I think that's one of the reasons our, our, we got so busy, our utilization was so high because everybody had access to, to booking their cases, to getting their cases done. And they also started transitioning or deciding, well, we don't need to do this case at this OR, we can do it over here at this OR. And so they started shifting different types of cases that for my particular OR, we hadn't necessarily worked with those surgeons, we hadn't done those types of cases. And now here we are, all of a sudden on the fly, we're working with new doctors, doing new types of cases, a little bit harder cases, a little bit higher acuity cases. And so we all had to really just work together to communicate with the teams from the other ORs, learning what we needed, making sure we had instruments. Um, it's very exhausting, but we have really been able to work together through all of that to get these cases done and to keep going. But it got challenging at times too, because like for my OR with doing new types of cases, new surgeons that we're working with, trying to get all of that put together and trying to make sure that we were providing the best patient care was challenging when it was 
very suddenly you're doing something new. But I think, I mean, we handled it very well. And I think that we have been able to really provide good care to our patients, even though it's been a little different and it's been really busy. And for us in infection prevention, I think this experience, it kind of forced us to collaborate in, in a lot of different ways when when looking at different workflows. And I think no matter where you were in the hospital, you had to look at different workflows, whether it was PPE related, whether it was just whatever supplies you had and you had to figure out how to don and doff. Um, one of the, I think, biggest challenges that we all faced was what were we gonna do with N95s? Were we going to reuse them? Were we not? We're gonna reprocess, were we not? How are we gonna do that? And with all of the processes like this, whether you were gonna do that or not, you had to figure out what your new workflow was gonna be. So with infection prevention, you had to work together with your OR and with your sterile processing. And with these new workflows, how are you going to find your experts? And with what Kelly was saying, a lot of the folks that we would normally call in to work through these experts with us, with our clinical educators and all of these folks, they weren't coming in. No one was allowed in our, our building if you didn't already work there. So it it was just kind of a, a crazy time where we weren't able to kind of do our, our phone a friend because we could only phone them. They weren't able to come in and walk through these things. So we it, were having to lean on our clinical educators in a little bit of a different way. And I, I talk about this all the time because I think it's really important that you know who your experts are and that you know that just because they aren't coming into your facility that you still need to be able to reach out to, to people who can help you. And this is where we learn to collaborate differently, whether you FaceTime them, whether you just call them, whether you do Zoom education sessions, which we've done a lot here, just because someone can't come in and do an in-service in person, you can still do a Zoom education session with them or FaceTime somebody and show them. When we've had to do um, capper or papper uh, troubleshooting when things have gone wrong, I've FaceTimed our experts to show them what's going wrong and they help me fix it. So we've really had to think outside of the box when it comes to bringing in our experts, with, especially with some of our vendors, with figuring out how to get them into the facility without maybe physically having them there. So I think that's important that we think outside of the box and, and how to use our experts. It doesn't mean that we can't use them just because they can't physically come in like they used to. So I think that's really important that now we know that we can collaborate in a lot of different ways, even if travel is restricted. Thank you for, for sharing all of those bits of insight. Um, something that I wanna ask all of you, um, you are tasked as leaders of your organizations. <laughs> um, you're tasked with being one of the people that other people look to for guidance and look to for um, basically to tell them how they should react in a certain situation. That's, that's the leader's position for better or for worse is you're kind of a billboard for how to react to certain situations. And that's a really, really heavy load to bear. And so honest question for you and for everyone in the audience who would be willing to share, like one word answer, how are you? Honestly, like just tell me how you are because <laughs> I'm really curious. You, I know that it's it's important that you, you know, put on a, an optimistic face and things like that. But if you were just to pick one word just today and say, how are you? What would that word be? I'm tired. <laughs> tired. Same, tired. Yeah. Okay. I think when people ask me that, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> that's fair. That's honestly, that's fair. <laughs> it, I, and I, I would say, especially we're in we're in Women's Month, and it was just International Women's Day, and you know, it. I, I'd say more power to the people that are also trying to be the working moms out there because these jobs are hard and then you go home and if, if you're a working mom, you have an even harder job when you get home. So mm -hmm. I think we're, some of us are even more exhausted because we have two jobs. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm good. So, you know, I'm back <laughs> with family, um, and living in Minnesota, it's been nice because our cold winters, um, I've been in Florida and Atlanta and South Carolina a lot. So um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm doing good. That's amazing. The reason I ask is that I, like I said, as leaders, you're you're always the ones that have to 
show others how to react and how to act and how to respond. And I think that there is a lot of value in checking in with yourselves too. And so um, thank you for just being honest about where you're at today. And obviously, as we navigate the coming weeks and the coming months, that it will change by the day. But um, I wish those of you who are tired rest. And <laughs> those of you who don't know how you are, I hope it continues to be more and more positive. Uh, and for those of you who um, in the audience who, who tuned in and answered this question, we've gotten excited and hopeful. And so it's, it's cool to see some optimistic um, states of being so that's great. Uh, the next question that I have for all of you is what did you or your department learn about itself during the pandemic? We're talking a lot about lessons learned and how we can better prepare for what's next in terms of the next global health issue. Um, what is what are one or two of the biggest things that your department has learned about itself in terms of either culture or your ability to communicate or your go to resources as a department? Um, if you could share those things, that would be that would be wonderful. And Melanie, let's start with you. I'm unmuted this time. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I and I realize this is going to be a very positive response and I don't want to gloss over how hard we've worked or how exhausted I know that our staff is because they are. Um, but through all of this, more than anything, they have shown how flexible they are and how really resilient they have been in spite of the uncertainty, in spite of the all of the unknowns with all of the variables that we've had to deal with. At the end of the day, they have taken everything that's been thrown at them and they've kept going and they've kept working. Um, We've done our best to, you know, take care of them and give them vacation days, give them the days off that they've asked for. They have been covered. If they did get COVID, they were taken care of. And our facility really did a great job in taking care of them in the, through all of this last year. But we have been busy. We've been busier than we have been. And they have just, they've just really shown that they're a great group of people that are dedicated to what they do. And they, they can take what's been thrown at them and they can, they can give our patients very good care, even when it's crazy and unknown and uncertain. And Kelly, what about you? So the one thing I think that, you know, we've learned is how, you know, we, we often come together, we can all brainstorm, we can collaborate, as we talked about, um, come up with different ideas, different ways to do our job. And then even, you know, when we're on site with customers, you know, kind of saying, okay, you know, what, what can we do um, to keep ourselves safe and to keep them safe? Because we're right next to a customer doing, you know, when we're doing training. So we're right there one-on-one -on -one with um, individuals. And so, you know, just kind of having to say, okay, you know, we, we can do this and stay safe. And, um, you know, I just look at um, our creative ways. And as I said, you know, back to kind of doing those, everything kind of going virtual um, and, you know, trying to get, you know, do everything for our customers, which we've been very successful, but just still that, um, you know, that, that challenge that, that we've had. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we've, we learned a lot. Um, we have grown a lot and I just think, you know, with, if this happens again, we can say, well, we've done it before. So. So in the sterile processing setting, I think I'm just really proud of our team for the amount of resilience that they also showed and how that team resilience, how it kind of fueled our mission to give the health care we want our loved ones to receive, helped us dedicate ourselves to processes and the policies to make sure that we were delivering, um, we were delivering the best possible product um, despite the amount of transitions and supply shortages. Um, but but it's the human component that was um, the most awe-inspiring for me. I think what we learned is how to accept and, and support each other as human beings in all our glory and our weaknesses. And uh, I think those who had strong emotional intelligence and those skills, those are the ones who we all gravitated towards because they were the calm in the center of the storm, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, and as for infection prevention, um, if we didn't know it before, we it just confirmed for us how important our presence in the units and in the departments really was for everybody. What we started doing even more so than we already did before was just making sure that we spent a lot of time on the clinical units and and with our team members talking to them answering their questions um, we did this even more so when COVID started than, than we ever had before because people had so many questions and like i said before they really wanted someone to ask those questions to i spent a lot of time in sterile processing myself just working alongside of sterile processing which i think is so important for ips to do even when it's not COVID, just to do it um, anyways, just to work alongside your team members. We spend a lot of time um, just in the ORs. We talked with anesthesia a lot, which is a, a relationship that we never had as good as we do now, just because everybody needed that person to know that they had to talk to. So in our facility, every department has an IP that's assigned to them so that they had that one person they could go to with, with questions, with isolation concerns, or if they just needed someone to talk to about COVID. And that has been the most beneficial thing that we found during COVID um, with our department and, and that we know that we couldn't have been successful this past year if, if our department, department had not partnered so well with all of the other units and departments throughout the hospital. And, and I know that they all have appreciated it a lot too and have felt a lot more comfortable knowing that the IP team has always been here for them even though it it has been a, a lot of work for us, I think that it has made our our facility and our organization a lot better for it. All right, wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> One thing that I do want to mention to everyone who is tuned in, um, let me just take a look here really quick. So this this discussion is worth one CE credit. Um, so <clears throat> I want to give instructions for those of you who are seeking CE um, a CE certificate uh, through Ishmer CBSPD. Uh, at the end of this discussion in all of the chat feeds on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Facebook, I will actually give a code word um, that and a link <clears throat> to a form that you can enter that code word in to download your certi your CE certificate. So. Uh, know that you can just stay on this feed uh, at the very end and you'll get that link. And that code word is preparedness. <clears throat> and so as we kind of end this conversation and head into our final question for the panelists, preparedness is a big part of what we've learned, what we've lived through, um, and those lessons that we'll carry with us into the future in, in the effort to be more prepared and more and better prepared for what's to come. So panelists, before we get to this last question, again, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all of you for sharing your insights. I know it's not been an easy year for anyone. It's been very trying. It's been, it's ebbed and flowed in many different ways. And the resiliency is what I'm gonna come back to because I've heard that from all of you. The, the resiliency of your teams, the resiliency of yourselves, and just the opportunity to learn more about yourselves and your departments through something um, like a pandemic. So um, those things are great to hear. And I know that the folks tuned in have probably taken away a lot of great lessons from that. So thank you for sharing. Uh, the final question that I wanna ask all of you uh, is, we all know <clears throat> that this hasn't been the first major interruption in our industry and likely won't be the last. So whether it's another pandemic, whether it's a natural disaster, a supply shortage, whatever it may be, how will you and the collaborative teams that you've built be better prepared to tackle the future if those things or when those things do come about? Um, <clears throat> and I'd love to start with Marie, if you don't mind. I think you're on mute. <laughs> it's my turn to be on mute, huh? <laughs> We're all taking turns. It's okay. <laughs> so, um, as you know, Lindsay, this is, we've already faced our first disaster. Um, last summer um, in Cedar Rapids, the derecho hit, and that was really a day. Um, we lost all our communication. We lost our internet, phone lines, cell phones. We lost power. We lost water. Um, and this was in the midst of a COVID surge that was happening. 
our patient volumes more than doubled in the next few days because of all the injuries that we had that happened during the storm, but even more of them that happened after the storm, chainsaws and people falling out of trees and, and different sorts of scenarios. So um, what was most interesting to me is this was harder than what we had faced with COVID because many of our team didn't have power for three weeks, no running water, no way to do laundry, no childcare, no school. Um, there was no gas, gasoline to be found in the city. We couldn't find ice. Um, and so a lot of my staff, you know, would we'd end up working um, sometimes double shifts and then we would drive hours to pick up food for our children, ice, uh, gasoline so that we could get to get to work. Um, and that was really, <laughs> it was a really tough few weeks, but um, the amount of dedication the team showed was amazing. We were sharing generators. We were working with one another, you know, I was doing laundry for certain staff members at home, um, whatever we could do to help one another. It was really a community effort in the building. Um, our VPs and directors were present and they helped lead the charge um, to literally be without phones in the building and none of our cell phones worked. Um, you know, a lot of management, we were runners um, and trying to help communicate here and there. But what I would say is I think the dedication to our community, the team displayed in the aftermath of the derecho was, it was nothing short of extraordinary. Um, and what I learned from that and what it helped me know going forward is that the human spirit gives us capacity to accomplish great things. We overcome limitations when we change our perspective. And I think the present moment, whether it's a derecho or COVID, it's it's really only tip of the paintbrush. The journey begins with the first stroke and our spirit sees us through to the last. I love that. And I just want to call out your mention of the human spirit because that also comes back to resiliency and the opportunity that we have to see each other as humans and as people who in various settings are scared or are, you know, worried about their professional life, their family life, whatever it may be. Yeah. It all comes back to understand, having that understanding and ha honestly having that grace well, for and the it people is, around us. It's very true because after the derecho hit, we couldn't get out of the building because we had down power lines and water everywhere. Mm -hmm. We didn't know if our children were safe. Wow. We didn't know if our families were safe. A lot of us, um, some of our our, our folks literally didn't had trees inside their houses and they just let it ride and kept coming to work. Mm -hmm. So um, kind of working through that fear um, and making ourselves useful until it was safe for us to leave the building um, was extraordinary. We had water pouring in to the basement um, and flooding and we had water coming in through the windows due to the force of the wind and uh, you could you could hear doors getting ripped off the buildings and staff grabbed blankets and they ran all the way up the stairs and just started helping where they could, moving patients, mm. um, trying to contain water and, and some of those things. And um, in spite of the fear, the love for the patients and, and for the team is what drove us that day. If that doesn't speak to the heart and soul of healthcare workers, I, don't, I honestly don't know what does. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that and some special love sent to those in Iowa uh, who lived through two um, very big interruptions uh, this last year. Um, Jill, I'm going to send it over to you. Um, what are some things that your team will be better prepared to tackle uh, in the next major healthcare interruption? Sure. Uh, thanks. And I, I think that as a, an organization and, and just as, as IPs in general, we'll be better prepared just knowing that we, one, we know that we're not alone, but as a hospital, I know that we know that it has to be an interdisciplinary group. I think we know better those groups that we need to make sure that we have involved. Um, I think that it's, it's great to know that people like sterile processing, EVS, those are the groups that sometimes get left out of these bigger discussions until right at the very end. And, and I think that that is something that we need to always keep in mind that, um, you know, when you have these kind of big things that are happening, that there, there are lots of groups that are going to have big, big pieces in these disasters and in these planning 
phases that they need to be um, in, in these plants up front instead of right at, at the end. And I think that we've learned a lot of lessons with that de depending on what the emergencies are. But when you're planning for these things and you're practicing these emergencies, it's, it's better to have everybody up front and at the table from the very beginning. And I think we've learned a lot from that, maybe not just with COVID or Ebola or things like that, but especially with what we were just learning about, um, how do you plan for those things? Um, you know, how do you plan for major water line breaks or, or things like that? These are the things that we, we need to be talking about and we need to make sure everybody's at the table and we know what to do because you don't have time to plan for those things when they actually happen. And I think that we've also learned that over communication is better than not communicating. And I, I think we've learned that during, during COVID and we've learned about fear and we've learned about uncertainty and how much you really need to understand what staff are feeling and making sure that 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 is something that we put at the forefront of our minds rather than not thinking about it at all because that is a real thing absolutely and kelly from the vendor perspective i know at beyond clean we've had um, the unique opportunity to partner with census technologies in a lot of ways like this panel discussion, for example, and see how you've been able to pivot in the midst of everything. Um, so what are some ways that your team will be better prepared to tackle the next major healthcare interruption? Yep. So as I've said, you know, like this, this year, I feel has been really a live and learn. And, you know, so we weren't able to have our annual conference um, that we typically have in Nashville. And so, you know, we came up with webinars, um, we did some, um, you know, different ways that's, that our customers and, and just anyone in general could, you know, earn different um, CE credits, uh, lots of learning opportunities that we um, had. We had an app that uh, people subscribe to. And so just looking at what we've learned in this last year and knowing that, okay, if or when this happens again, then, you know, we can take from there what we've learned and then kind of go with it. So I feel like when you think of 9-11 and how that changed the world for travel, now I think of, okay, COVID, how this is going to change the world for healthcare. And, you know, it's just kind of taking everything that, that we have and then learning and, and going forward. Um, when I go on site, you know, I go, on, I go to hospitals all over the United States. And so it's, you know, every hospital I go to has a little different protocol. You know, some allow cloth masks, some don't. Um, some, you know, require that you do all these different things and some don't. And so even with that, it's just kind of, you know, learn to go with the flow and uh, whatever hospital you're in, you know, abide by what they have to say. And then everything that I even take from those hospitals, you know, I take a little bit here and there because it's like, well, maybe I should be doing this when I'm on a plane or, you know, in a rental car or even just out with family. Um, so it's been a great learning opportunity. And, you know, you know, I always, I always find the positive. I look for the positive and everything. So, you know, um, we learned a lot. And, you know, I just, if something happens again, I think it's going to kind of be that, well, we've done it before. We can collaborate. We can get through this, work together and, you know, pull through. Yeah. And Melanie, I'm excited to hear your perspective as well. Two of my very best friends are nurses, um, one here in Minnesota and one in uh, Wisconsin. And so I've gotten a, a very detailed account of their lives over the past year. And it's been just, it's one of those things where it's like this never ending movie with twists and turns that are unexpected and it's like how do you find how have you found the the bright side uh, i love that kelly i love that you're able to find the bright yeah. side and look at the bright side but you know from a nursing perspective and you're seeing patients struggling and you're seeing everything unfold in front of you um, how will your teams be better prepared i think that what covid really demonstrated i guess in the operating room anyway is how important teamwork is. All Everyone here has mentioned teamwork. How important it is that we get out of our individual silo and work with other departments and other teams to really pull together. And, but some of the other things that, that helped and that would help in the future also, that I think Jill mentioned it earlier, genuinely and openly expressing gratitude for the hard work that your team is doing, for the sacrifices you know that they're making, for the hard work that they're doing every single day makes a huge difference. Um, and that is something for any type of pandemic or natural disaster or anything you go through, these people are, are putting their lives on the line or their, or their safety maybe, or their 
their own security and they're working through it. And we as leaders really need to be appreciative and, and tell them genuinely that we're thankful for them. But also communication is key. Um, getting the information out, but not just communicating, you know, broadly, but maybe with some transparency that says, hey, this situation's changing. We don't know everything right now, but we're going to tell you what we do know. And when it changes, we're going to make sure you know that too. And being upfront and honest that we, we don't know, we don't have all the information right now, but we're going to give you what we've got and make sure that you stay as educated as we are. And it gives, as a nurse, having as much information at your fingertips as possible. I think it gives you the, I don't know, the the ability, the best ability possible to really take care of your patients because you feel educated and informed and fully, fully informed, I guess, is maybe the best thing is just that transparency and communication. I love that. And I love the, the part where you don't have to have all the answers. The transparency and communication is what matters and understanding that it's an ever evolving situation, whatever it may be, and making sure everyone else knows that things might change tomorrow and we're all gonna get through it and we're all gonna do that together. I think that right. that's huge. Uh, thank you everyone so much for sharing your insights, sharing your experience. I love the the multi um, multidisciplinary perspective that we were able to provide today uh, to everyone who has tuned in. And I just wanted to give one more special thank you to Marie in Cedar Rapids, Iowa at Unity Point Health. Thank you um, for sharing not only your COVID experience, but also what it was like living through the derecho as well. Um, Jill, uh, Infection Prevention Manager at Emory University Hospital Midtown. Shout out to everyone at Midtown. Thank you so much for sharing the infection prevention side and, and really <clears throat> reminding everyone the importance of the role of those in your department uh, in every other department. Um, Melanie, thank you so much um, for tuning in from Alabama and sharing the operating room perspective. I have such a big heart for nurses um, and all healthcare professionals, but just the resiliency and the the ability to keep showing up is um, it's remarkable. And Kelly, um, from the vendor perspective, um, we, none of us can do our jobs without the vendor partners who provide the services and the products um, provided by the vendor partners. And so, thank you for being persistent and being resilient as a team as well. And that goes for all vendors out there. Uh, as a reminder, everyone, uh, the CE code word is preparedness. Uh, and I will add the link to the form that you can put that code word into um, through Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube on the, the, um, the discussion feed. So watch for that. A special thank you to Census Technologies for sponsoring this event and helping plan it and sending out love, sending out light to everyone who is still showing up every day. Um, thank you for what you do. And with that, a reminder to keep fighting dirty. Thanks, everybody.